we always try to, to uh, make it as best we can with what we have. And uh, I, I appreciate the feedback that we've gotten through the years. But also, um, uh, remember, we are going, we're kind of moving through here. Uh, we are going to be baptizing Connor tonight, all right? And that is just, I'm so excited. I, that's why we've got, we've got a lot of family here to see that. And uh, Connor is just uh, growing in the Lord. And I'm looking forward to what the, what the Lord has for our service tonight. Amen. All right, well, let's pray. And I'm going to have Judson come up. We'll do our theme song. And uh, so, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, how good you are to us. We thank you for the grace that you have given to us through, uh, Lord, just, just to be able to come and, and, and worship you and to know you. And uh, we thank you for the free gift of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, that uh, not only can we be saved, but that you give us full salvation, that we can uh, live the abundant life in Christ. And Lord, we're going to learn a little bit about that tonight. Lord, we thank you, and we pray that you would just bless our preacher, bless everything that's done. We pray that it would all be to your honor yes. and your glory. And Lord, we just thank you uh, for everything that you're going to do tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand up and sing our theme song. I will not fail you. You are my precious child. What doubts and fears arise, I will not fail you. Just trust in all I say, I've won the victory. That you might triumph every day. There is nothing I cannot do. Don't be weary, for I know the plans I have for you. I will not fail you. I'll be right by your side. Are complete, by strength and courage, as you abide, I will not fail. Amen. You can be seated, and at this time we're going to take up an offering for our preacher, and anything that goes into the offering plate, unless specified otherwise, is going to go to Evangelist John Ben Delbert, all right? And uh, he has been a blessing so far. And if you haven't heard some of the messages, you should go on YouTube, uh, and you can uh, look up the messages there. I can give you a link if you want me to give you a link. Uh, but uh, just listen to them, and listen to them again if you need to, because there's this rich rich information in there that will help you to live the life of Christ. And so, uh, uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan Langley if he'd lead us in prayer, and you be sure to give with a heart of thanksgiving, and I know the Lord will bless you that. Father, we thank you tonight for the blessings you bestowed upon us. We thank you for visiting with us, Lord, for making yourself known, and Lord, just the prayer meetings that have been had leading up to this meeting, and we praise you for that. We praise you for the people, Father, that have dedicated time and effort to seek in your face. Father, I do pray that you be in front of that Gilbert tonight. Strengthen him as he preaches your word. Open our hearts, Lord, and our ears to hear your word that we might live more abundantly with you, Lord, that we might be able to live the revived life, Lord, that is being proclaimed. Father, I do pray that as we come to a time to give back to you, Lord, that you would help us to be joyful and cheerful givers, to give as you commanded, Lord, and we'll be careful to honor you and praise you for those also. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Galatians chapter 3 in your Bibles tonight. Galatians chapter 3. And I know this is a very, very special service. And I'm looking forward to the baptism at the end. And thank you guests that are here for that. And thank all of you that are here uh, as part of the church here as well. And uh, may the Lord breathe on us tonight in a very special way. You know, it's interesting, the matter of baptism. Uh, the Great Commission, Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. And then baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teach them to observe all things. Have you ever wondered uh, the placement of baptism in that Great Commission? Obviously, making disciples or getting saved, uh, that is the concept of putting your faith in Jesus. He does all the saving. And the blood of Jesus washes uh, all the sin. So baptism doesn't wash away sin. Right. And yet it is spelled out as the first step of obedience after becoming a disciple of Jesus before the rest of it which says teaching them to observe all things. So it is separated out from all of the rest of what we might call discipleship. Why? Why? It obviously has been given by God a place of extreme importance. Why? What is that importance? What's the meaning? Well, it's fascinating. Several days ago, uh, the Lord laid a certain message on my heart for tonight before I knew that there was going to be a baptism at the end of the service. <laughs> and so let's read a text that deals with the why of that question. And so this is Galatians chapter 3. And I'm going to be reading verses 26 and 27. The inspired word says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, in the scripture, there's water baptism, and there is spirit baptism, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's that connection that will help us understand uh, the answer to our question. I want to speak tonight on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what a better place to do that than in a Baptist church, don't you think? <laughs> and yet, strangely, this topic is rarely addressed in our churches. But as the Bible gives it, we need to understand it and embrace it in its entirety. So let's pray and let's ask the Spirit of God to be our teacher tonight. Lord, we thank you already for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for this special night. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, these that are gathered here. And uh, Lord, I pray that each one would hear from you. Lord, from the youngest to the oldest. Lord, from the one saved the longest to the one most recently saved. To perhaps one who needs to be saved. Oh, Spirit of God, take the truth. Open our eyes. And in that illumination, would you convince us yes. of the truth? And so convince us that a faith response would be the, the obvious natural response. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus to protect us from the attack of the enemy tonight in any way. So, Lord Jesus, we claim our position in you on the throne. Fire above all principality and power. And in your name, I exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would yes. seek to distract and hinder yes. the night. And trust you that that not be allowed. Right. Lord, breathe on us tonight, afresh and anew. Yes. And may you be honored. Lord Jesus, may you be lifted up. Amen. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The most powerful distinction possible is the recognizable sense of the presence of God in and on a believer in Jesus. That is the greatest distinction. Not what we may wear or other kinds of things like that. No, not that they're not important. But the greatest distinction is when there is a recognizable sense that God is in that person. God is on that person. That person is clothed with God. And this recognizable sense of God's presence on God's people comes, it's manifested when God's people know experientially the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now what are we talking about? Some may be familiar with the name Duncan Campbell, used of God in the Lewis Revival, uh, about 60 years ago uh, off the northwest coast of Scotland. 
He got saved as a young man in his early 20s. That's quite a story in and of itself. And uh, when he got saved, I mean, he got excited about the Lord and he began to witness, but he was quickly drafted into World War I. And he was in a, a, a cavalry uh, troop uh, with the, the Scottish uh, uh, tr uh, troopers and so on. And on uh, one occasion, as they were uh, there in the war, they plunged into the fray and uh, it was not going well. His horse was shot out from under him and uh, he was wounded. He was on the ground. There were the dead and there were the dying all around him with riderless horses running over all of these bodies in a chaotic mess. And uh, he said that the blood flowed from his wounds and he felt that he was probably going to die. And he said there was a sense of unfitness that enveloped him. He rejoiced in the fact that he had accepted Jesus. He knew he was saved on the merits of Jesus alone. He was on his way to heaven. But there was something about being in that war that had exposed to him the inner depravities of his heart. In other words, uh, he was brought up in the Scottish Highlands. That would have been a very conservative and religious area, even if not all were saved. And now he was on the mainland of Europe in a war, and he was seeing uh, all sorts of debauchery, and he felt like his own heart had been exposed with things he, he uh, had uh, uh, that shocked him. And grieved that he had accomplished so little for the Savior, Savior as he's there thinking he's going to die, he recalled the hymn, Must I go and, and empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? And he thought that's what was going to happen. But then the Canadian regiment ordered a charge, and their horses came across that field. And one of those horses' hooves hit Duncan Campbell in the spine. And he yelled out, which would be a natural response. <laughs> And uh, they cleared the heights, gave a brief pause at what was happening. That trooper remembered there was a live body back there. And because he had yelled, he knew that, and he went back. He found Duncan Campbell, and he threw his body on the back of his horse. And uh, he was taking him back to the medical station. Well, there was so much loss of blood that Duncan Campbell still thought that there was no hope of life. And he remembered a prayer that Robert Murray McShane used to pray, that Duncan Campbell's father used to pray there in their home, and there on the back of that horse, persuaded that he was dying, Duncan Campbell, in a deep uh, agony of earnestness, cried out, Lord, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. <laughs> and he said instantly, the power of God possessed him. His words. He said, like a purging fire, the Holy Spirit swept through his personality, bringing cleansing and renewal until, he said, I felt as pure as an angel. <laughs> what a radical contrast in moments. And he said, I, I thought I was going to go straight to heaven. <laughs> but he said, they dropped me off at the medical station. And a nurse who was also Scottish recognized his uh, background being Scottish, and she came over to him and singing in Gaelic, uh, their, that Irish language, uh, she sang the words that we know of as there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Huh. And he was already in an ecstasy of joy, and his heart was just bubbling over in praise to God, and he began to quote in Gaelic. Yeah, the metrical version of Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And as he was praising the, the Lord, the Spirit manifested the presence of Jesus in that little medical station. Many wounded soldiers were also there. Canadians who could not understand Gaelic, but they could understand the sense of the presence of God in the room. Mm. And as a result, seven Canadian soldiers put their faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Later, Duncan Campbell would refer to this moment as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does he mean? Is that legitimate to describe what happened there with that phrase? What are we talking about? Well, the truth is, as we look at the text tonight... We're going to see that it's going to open up just an umbrella of truth that has so much detail under it, and uh, and uh, it can uh, it can it, it'll open up to us the possibility of knowing experientially 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because that's what happened in his life. And we'll understand what takes place at salvation, what then can later be experienced. And we can ask ourselves, are we experiencing the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit or spirit baptism? And how do we avail ourselves of it so that we experience what we have? Well, tonight I want to point out three concepts to answer those two questions. The first two concepts will answer the first question. The third concept will uh, answer the second question. The first concept tonight is what we're dealing with is one baptism with two directions. The scripture tells us over in Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we're going to see that the big point is spirit baptism, of which water baptism is the picture. You remember the words of John the Baptist, like in Mark 1, verse 8, I baptize you with water. Here comes one after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That lets us know that water baptism pictures spirit baptism. Now, among preachers and theologians, there's sometimes debate in our New Testament as to when a passage mentions the word baptism as to whether or not that particular passage is dealing with water baptism or spirit baptism and there's sometimes some heated with love of course debate <laughs> <laughs> now there's a real simple way to figure out if a passage is talking about water baptism or if it's talking about spirit baptism if the person doing the baptizing is a human and if the element being baptized into is H2O <laughs> then it is water baptism like we're going to see later on tonight but if the person doing the baptizing is deity and the element being baptized into is deity then it is spirit baptism hmm. Looking back at our text, what it says, for as many, or excuse me, verse 26, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. When that happens, tied to that moment, uh, verse 27 says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So is this talking about water baptism or spirit baptism? Spiritual. This is spirit baptism, of which water baptism is the picture. Now, we're talking about one baptism that has two directions. The first direction is that you're baptized by the Spirit into Christ. Here, the text just says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, it doesn't say who's doing the baptizing. Uh, we see that spelled out for us over in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are you all baptized into one body, and according to the previous verse, it's then referring to the body of Christ. So, the first direction of baptism is that the Holy Spirit immerses you as a believer in Jesus into Christ. The Spirit is the agent, and you're being baptized into Christ, into the body of Christ. Now, the text could be given. For time's sake, I'll uh, not mention every detail, uh, but uh, those passages let us know that clarity. The second direction of baptism is that when the Spirit baptizes you into Christ, you're also baptized by the Son with the Spirit. Now, in our text, it says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, we saw in Corinthians, that's by the Spirit, then it says, have put on Christ. Again, referring to what John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there comes one after me. That's Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So when a person puts their faith in Jesus, verse 26, at that moment, and the grammar of all the passages brings this out so clearly, at that moment, as a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit immerses you into Jesus, and at the same time, you're endued, or you put on Jesus. Now, let's think of it this way. If I were to take a sponge and I were to dip it into water, forgive the term, can I say 
baptize it into water. So we get the picture. Okay. So I take a sponge and immerse it into water. As it goes into the water, it's immediately enveloped with the water as the water moves right into the sponge. And in similar fashion, when a person puts their faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit immerses them into Jesus. And as they are submerged into Jesus, they're enveloped with Jesus. They're clothed with Jesus. They put on Jesus as he places his spirit right into them. That's what happens when a person gets saved. Now, when it says right here, have put on Christ, the, the word underneath that is the word endued. In fact, that's how it's translated over in Luke 24. Uh, speaking of being endued with power from on high. So, one baptism with two directions. The first direction is that the Holy Spirit places you into Christ. The second direction is Christ places his spirit into you. And thus you are endued with or clothed with the spirit. Amen. Second concept. The two directions represent two provisions. This is so important because provision, what's provided in our salvation? Yes, we're on our way to heaven, but there's so much more than that, as good as that is. Uh, so uh, one baptism, two directions, but these two directions represent two provisions. In the first direction, when the Holy Spirit immerses us into Christ, then that indicates from that moment onward, you as a believer are in Christ. Amen. And that reality means that you have a new identification. Your identity is not your worst day. Your identity is you're in Christ. You are accepted in the beloved. Amen. You're in it. That is how the Father identifies you. In fact, the in Christ phrases occur in our New, our New Testaments 242 times. I don't think we realize how much that is emphasized. It's more, it's more emphasized in Christ being in us. It's us being in Christ is mentioned 242 times. 216 of those are in the Pauline epistles. And that in Christ position, that in Christ identification represents the, pro the provision of authority over the enemy. This is fascinating. Where does Christ sit right now? At the right hand of the Father. See, Ephesians 1 spells it out. That God displayed his mighty power when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand. That's the throne. That's authority. The throne. Hebrews tells us when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, the throne. The authority on high. Yeah. Now friends, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, according to our text, you're placed into Jesus. Right. Right. And he right now, in his glorified body, sits on that throne. Right. And in the spirit dimension realm, there's a physical realm, there's a spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, you're there. <laughs> now physically, yeah, we're right here at Tarboro, North Carolina. Yeah. But for every child of God in this room, Regardless of how old you are, regardless of how long you've been saved, regardless of how long you've been right with God since the last time you blew it, <laughs> or whether or not you are right with God, if you are saved, you're in Him. Right. And in the spiritual realm, you're there. Do you know the spiritual realm does not have the geographical boundaries that the physical realm has? That's right. You're there. See, it's not figurative. It's literal. It's just that it's spiritual, not physical. In that spiritual realm, you're there. You are there, far above. See, if Jesus sits far above all principality and power, and that's what Ephesians tells us. Yeah. God displayed his mighty power when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand, far above all principality and power. Yes. It spells out the details. Okay, well, if you're in him, and you are, then in Christ, as one author puts it, you are as far above the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. As Christ is. That's right. Yes. That's good. Now, friends, when that truth actually sinks in so that we're convinced by the Spirit, you'll probably shout hallelujah. <laughs> I know you will because you're in North Carolina. Now, <laughs> Michigan is where I'm from. It, it takes a couple of weeks until that truth really gets way down deep, and finally they might shout. Uh, but <laughs> down here, you don't understand that. 
Friends, it's amazing. That's the provision. It's authority. He's on the throne. You're in him. He's the head. It's his authority. We're the body. We get to exercise it. Good. There is a defense to protect from the fiery darts of the enemy, Ephesians 6, as well as an offense to pull down the strongholds of the enemy, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So, the first direction represents the first provision. It's you in Christ, and therefore, Christ is on the throne. You're identified in him, and it's the provision of authority over the enemy. Yeah. The second direction, of course, we noted, is Christ places his spirit into you. So this is the truth of Christ in you, which is the provision of divine ability. So you're in Christ, that's divine authority. Christ is in you, that's divine ability. He moves in to empower us, to enable us, divine ability, down here. So we're in him to deal with the up there realm, the spiritual realm. He's in us to deal with down here, the physical realm of the world and the flesh. And so there is this amazing provision, this amazing power, this amazing divine ability. Now, we begin to see an umbrella effect taking place. The grand umbrella truth is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Under that umbrella, so far we see two major uh, directions. We're in him. Yeah. He's in us. Yes. The in him is divine authority over the enemy. The he in us is divine ability to deal with the world and the flesh. Yeah. Now, the Christ in us part of it, the divine ability part of it, is wrapped up biblically in the word endowment. Our text says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, so that's us and him authority, but here's the other direction, have put on, I've already noted, have been endued with Christ. Now this is fascinating. You remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples after the resurrection, just before he ascends, and he tells them in Luke 24, uh, uh, to wait in Jerusalem until you're endued there's our same word, it means put on, it's like clothing, put on, okay, until you're endued with power from on high. Well, the parallel passage, same event, in Acts 1, there the wording is slightly different, and there Jesus says, okay, uh, uh, wait for the power, here's how you're going to know when it comes, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, do you see this? Yeah. In Luke 24, he says, wait for the power, until you're endued with power from on high, and Acts 1, wait for the power, until you're baptized with the Spirit. Ah. The second half of the baptism, not the into, but the with, is parallel to being endued with power from on high. So the endowment word is not equivalent to the whole baptism. It is the word that describes the second half, the second direction, the second provision. We're in tune with the divine ability of Christ in us to deal with down here. Yep. Yeah. Now, that provision has three emphases. So we have this big umbrella. We're in him. He's in us. There's divine authority over the enemy. There's divine ability to deal with the down here. The down here has three sections to it. As we unfold this from text after text, and I'm not walking you through the text, or we'd be here for hours, uh, just uh, summarizing them for you. But the first one, the first emphasis of the endowment is a, the, the anointing of understanding. So it's not equivalent with the whole baptism. It's not even equivalent with the whole endowment. It is one part of the endowment, which is one half of the baptism. So I hope we begin to see how all of this uh, staircase is down. But the anointing of understanding, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, the scripture says, but ye have, it's in the present tense, you're having. Look, if you're a child of God, this is true of you right now. Mm -hmm. It says, you are having an unction. That's the word anointing. Yeah, yes, sir. You are right now, every moment from the day you get saved forward, you are being given, you are having an anointing from the Holy One. And it says, and you know all things. Hmm. Hmm. Do you know there's a provision for knowing truth? Sure. Yeah. And you got it when you got saved. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's in the package. Yeah. This knowing. 
this anointing and understanding of the truth of God, and it's so that you're in due to speak that truth. Whether it's witnessing, whether it's preaching, whatever the case may be. You remember what Jesus said in the synagogue uh, on, uh, uh, in Luke chapter 4, as he reads Isaiah 61, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. See, and do, clothed with, put on. The Spirit of the Lord is upon the human Christ. And he says, Because he has anointed me to preach. So ultimately, the knowing, the illumination of truth is so we can communicate it. But it starts, you can't communicate something you don't understand. Right. You've got to understand. You've got to know it. So the anointing of understanding has to do with knowing truth. For example, Samuel Chadwick is a name that comes up when you read revival history. He wrote the way to Pentecost. And uh, he was an old-time Methodist. And uh, he was um, saved as a child... Uh, but he was from a very poor family. He was very uneducated as a little boy. Uh, just after a couple of years of school, they had to send him off to work, so he didn't get to keep to go, to go to school. And as a teenager, he would work 12-hour shifts. Then he would come home, but he was so hungry to, to know <laughs> truth, he would study his Bible. He would read and study his Bible for five hours. Now just think about this. He works 12 hours. Then he comes home and studies the Bible five hours, day after day after day, several years in a row as a teenager. Wow. That was his college. Probably better than most colleges today. But, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. There's good ones. But I can simply say it was, a good, it was a good education. Now, what he didn't understand was the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. But he understood a good work ethic and he understood the importance of the Word. And uh, so he had studied. Well, by the time he was 21, the Methodist bishops, you know, they are a different polity than Baptist, uh, they recognized this kid, this kid's serious, and so they placed him, because you can see that in the way they set up their polity in churches, uh, they placed him to be a pastor of a church. So now he's a pastor, he's 21. And uh, he thought if he could just craft really good sermons, work his head off to say it just right, you know, uh, that he could be a very successful pastor. So he worked hard. I mean, a kid already's got the work ethic. He worked hard on crafty messages. And after seven years, he was staring defeat in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the flesh profits nothing. But he was hungry. He began to hear of certain other pastors that were being revived through an experience of the Holy Spirit. And so that was deep in his heart and on his mind. And one night he was sat, sat in his living room before the fire. And God began to show him his pride. God began to show him the, the arrogance of self-dependence. The arrogance that he thought he could do spiritual work through fleshly power. Yeah. When the reality is flesh cannot do spirit. That's right. And so he sat there and he realized all of his effort was just him in the power of his own strength and wit. Trying to do what only God can do. And he got under such conviction. He went over to his stack of sermons. Well, after seven years, that's going to be quite a stack. Mm -hmm. I mean, very different than an evangelist. You know, seven sermons in a fast car. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can his name had to be a fast horse. But, uh, uh, I mean, he, you know, he was a pastor. He had to come up with all his new sermons. He went over and he grabbed that pile of sermons. And he walked over to the fireplace. And he threw them in. They're gone. Mm -hmm. He said the effect was immediate, and the Spirit, this is his words, fell on him. He describes it this way. There was a deep peace, a thrilling joy. I love this. A new sense of power. He said his mind, see we're talking about knowing, his mind was quickened. And he said there was a new faculty of understanding now keep in mind, when a person gets saved, all of that's provided, but you can have something provided and not access it. Right. Right. And now there's an access. He said there was a new faculty uh, of understanding. He said every power of his being was vitalized by the divine spirit. And he said the tide turned. He said the next Sunday he preached and the spirit brought conviction. Seven people were saved. He hadn't seen anybody saved. Seven! He said, one for every one of his fruitless years. Wow. And that church, for the next 
number of months experienced what they call their Pentecost. And thus his book, The Way to Pentecost. Fascinating. Amen. Friends, do you realize the provision to understand this book was given to you the day you got saved? Yeah. But if you're not understanding this book, somehow, somehow something's hindering. Yeah. We've got we to gotta figure out how this works. We're going to uh, unfold this, but we've got to start accessing what God's given to us. But there's more to the endowment than just understanding. There's also the filling for holiness. You see, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. Okay, so there's that second half of the baptism. Yes, you're in Him, but He's in you. You are indwelt by the Spirit. That occurred the day you got saved, and the Holy Spirit never leaves you. Right, right. Amen. And you are sealed with the Spirit. But when you access Him, and we'll see the access on the third point, then the Spirit in you imparts to you the very life of Jesus. You're infused with the Jesus life. You are infused with that life of Jesus and the Spirit streams that throne life of Jesus right into your being. And friends, the spiritual life is when the Spirit fills you with the life hmm. of Jesus. Amen. That's holiness. Amen. I used to think holiness was my box of uh, ideals. You know, my list of do's and don'ts. And, you know, the older I got, the, the, the don'ts got longer than the do's. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're going to be the farthest to the right. And uh, all of this kind of stuff. And some of it was good stuff, but I will tell you, an unsaved moralist can imitate all That's of that. That's right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. right. You sure can. It's not the same. It's not holiness unless it's energized by the Holy One. Amen. And when the Holy One energizes, yes, He never leads you to sin. He always leads you to do right. You'll do the right do's and you'll don't the right don'ts. Right. <laughs> But the key will be because Jesus is animating your personality. And the beauty of Jesus shines. That's holiness. It's just like when Keith and Melody Green got saved. Uh, how uh, this truth was brought out to them. Prior to their salvation. Uh, they, uh, they were hippies. 1960s. And uh, they were in LSD and trips and trying to find God and all these trips on, on drugs and so on. And, and they were into Eastern religions and it all came up empty. Sure. And they said, you know, every religion we study, Jesus was a good guy. Why don't we study him? <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> they started thinking, well, let's study Jesus. Well, how do we do this? And so whenever they heard a church that, you know, kind of talked about Jesus, novel idea. <laughs> They thought, well, let's go try them out. And some of them were good experiences, and some of them were a little different. And then they heard about a Hollywood actor, a famous guy, I don't remember the name, who had gotten born again. And they heard that he was going to give his testimony of how he came to know Jesus and got born again. They thought, well, maybe that's what we're looking for. Let's go. And they get there, and when he gets up, they said he had tattoos all over him and he looked like a Harley Davidson biker. Well, keep in mind, the guy got saved out of Hollywood. Yeah. And uh, so, they said, well, he doesn't look any different. And then Melody, she wrote the song, There is a Redeemer. She said when he began to speak, there was something in his voice hmm. we'd never heard before. And afterwards, they ran to meet him. And they said, face to face, Melody said, there was something in his eyes we'd never seen before. Amen. Friends, that, that's Jesus. Right. That's holiness. Yeah. That's the beauty of Jesus shining through, animating the human, human personality, the divine somebody in the human somebody, so that the human somebody is animated by the divine somebody. What an amazing plan of God. So there's this anointing of understanding. There's the filling for holiness. The anointing has to do with knowing truth. The filling has to do with living truth. Because Jesus is the truth. And the third part of this endowment is the empowering for service. Not just Christ in you to you, holiness, but through you to others, service. Rivers of living water flowing, John chapter 7. Ah, this is what John R. Rice, for whom I'm named, emphasizes in his book, The Power of Pentecost. And uh, the need for the empowering for service. 
So the anointing's a part of it, because you've got to know the truth that you're going to speak. The filling's a part of it, because if you're not holy, that's going to hinder. But now there can be the empowering so that when you speak, there's power. Yeah. Not only freeing you to be unashamed of Jesus, but convincing them that Jesus is the need in their own heart. Amen. I think of Charlie Kittrell, who's now with the Lord. Uh, I miss this dear man. He pastored in Indianapolis for 40 years and saw wonderful answers to prayer and multitudes of people saved. But it was not always so. He said he was a student at uh, college and he, you know, as a preacher boy, you have to go out so many and he did all that, but, you know, hardly anything happened. And it bothered him and he was hungry. He was seeking, Lord, what's missing? One day as he walked across his campus, he said the Spirit moved on him. He was aware that God was doing something. Amen. And so he found the nearest building, happened to be a classroom building, he went up to the third floor, found a room that nobody was in. And God met with him. And he met with God. And he knew it. He said the next time I went so on, somebody got saved. He said the next week somebody got saved. The next week somebody got saved. And for the next number of years, he led hundreds of people to Christ. Friends, all the provision is available when we get saved. But as in his case, he wasn't accessing it. But when he did, things changed. I wonder if this could change our experience. Like us tonight. Now friends, we have two concepts so far. There's one baptism with two directions. We're in Christ. He's in us. The second concept is that the two directions represent two provisions. The provision of being in Christ is his divine authority far above the enemy to deal with the enemy. But then he and us, there's the provision of that divine ability, that endowment, that being clothed with him, which has, which is that anointing of understanding, that filling for holiness, and that empowering for service. So that brings us to our third concept. The provisions, the two provisions are experienced by faith. It's not automatic. No. It's by faith. Romans 5, 2 says we have access by faith, by faith. Yes, into this grace wherein we stand. It starts by saying, in who? Jesus. See, there's the key. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Hebrews eleven six 6 says without faith, it is impossible to please him. Wow. You know, a carpenter may possess phenomenal tools to do his work in such a fine-tuned, remarkable way. But if he doesn't depend on the tools by using them, mm -hmm. yeah. it's going to be lousy work. <laughs> and friends, you and I have been given, forgive the terminology, the tools. It's much more than that. The person. We're in him and he's in us. Yes. But if we don't depend on our provisions, mm -hmm. we're trying to do spirit work in flesh power. Oh, yes, You're right. And we've been afraid, I think, of the Holy Spirit, perhaps because of some who went beyond what the Bible says in the name of the Spirit. But friends, for us to say, well, I don't want that wildfire experience, I'm going to tell you, no fire, no experience is another false experience. That's true. Right. And we've been afraid. Have you ever considered the verse in Acts 2.38 when the Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost and Peter got up and preached and the audience was under conviction and he lifts up Jesus, he quotes that passage that ends with, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was in the Old Testament before it was in the New. And uh, so on. And he preaches that message. That Christ arose and he reigns on high. And there's so much conviction they cry out. What have you seen that in the service? Mm -hmm. He hasn't even given his invitation yet. Mm -hmm. And they cry out, what shall we do? And he says, repent. That is, change what you believe. Back to his proposition. You've got to call on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Repent, change what you believe. Then he says, and get baptized. Right. Right. There's water baptism. Because that's how it plays out in Acts. We see that. Okay. But then he says this. And I've never heard anyone preach on this. I'm 61. And I'm a preacher's kid. And I've been in thousands of services. He then says, And take the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And 
Do you see how close he gets connected to water baptism? Because water baptism picks your spirit baptism. So take what the water baptism represents. The gift, the ministry of the spirit. Because through him you're in Christ to access his authority over the enemy. And through him he brings Christ into you to deal with the world and the flesh. Have you noticed in Galatians chapter 3? After it talks about receiving the Lord by faith at the beginning. Receiving the spirit by faith. The actual indwelling of the spirit. Galatians 3. And he goes on. And then he spells out justification. That that's what happens when you uh, put your faith in Jesus. And then in verse 14 he says, So that, oh there's more. You might receive. Not be given. But take what you have been given. Right. The promise of the Holy Spirit. So I ask you tonight, friend. You may have been saved for decades. Have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, God has given us two great gifts. In the person of the Son and in the person of the Spirit. Galatians 4, next chapter of our text, talks about God sent forth his Son. Verse 4. And we know from John 3, 16, God so loved the world, the, the whole world, that he gave his only begotten Son. Gave his Son. So the gift of the Son has been given unconditionally to the world, but to benefit from it, there's a conditional response that whosoever believes in him yeah. should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. So God's gift of his son, Jesus, is to the whole world. But who are the ones who benefit? Only those who believe in him. Only those who take. But as many as receive, take him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And if they don't take Jesus, though he's been given to them, they miss out. Yeah. Two verses later. For those who do believe in Jesus, for those who do take the first gift, this is the text says in Galatians 4, verse 6, that God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Mm -hmm. So when you do take Jesus, the spirit moves in. We already saw that. That's the second half of the baptism. Christ in you by the spirit. But now think, if the first gift of Jesus, in order to be fully benefited from, you've got to take by faith <laughs> him as savior, then what about this gift of the Spirit? Yes, he's in you. He resides in you. That happened the day you got saved. But if you ignore him, you're missing out. Yeah, that's right. You've got to take. Each gift has to be taken. It has to be received. That's what Peter was talking about on the day of Pentecost. And take, receive. It's not be given. That happens automatically when you believe. But take what's being given. That's the responsibility of faith. And friends, this is a privilege we have every day to keep accessing this amazing provision. Have you ever been tempted where this temptation hits you and it's not because you see a picture or it's not because you stepped on a Lego <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it's not because of something that happened in the physical realm and yet you've got this temptation rattling your brain? That's a fiery dart. That's a flaming arrow. That's thrown in from the enemy in the spiritual realm. It's not in the physical realm. Right. Mm -hmm. And friends, you have the privilege of saying, I take the reality of my position in Jesus on the throne far above the enemy, and I reject that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. See, take and act. We know it as trust and obey. I'm using different words to jar our thinking. Friends, when that hits you and you're thinking, man, how could that even be in my mind? Well, remember, temptation itself is not sin, so don't confess it, reject it. God, I claim my position to you. I reject that. You just lifted up the shield of faith, and when you do, it puts out, it quenches, it, it literally destroys the fiery darts of the enemy. Yeah, yeah. And there's a discernible lift in your spirit. You just got set free. Yeah. Or how about going on offense? 2 Corinthians 10. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. But they are mighty. Through God. See, there's your faith implied to the pulling down of strongholds. Mm -hmm. So we have the shield of faith against Satan's attack toward us. We have the weapon of faith to reverse the attack toward him and pull down the strongholds. 
I remember I was preaching in a Christian school in Atlanta, Georgia during the day, the church at night. They had a new student who had come in, a family had moved in from Russia. Uh, this is going back 20 years. And uh, uh, the Russian family didn't, uh, they looked at our public schools and they didn't want their kids to go there, so they put them in this Christian school, although they were Russian Orthodox and didn't want anything to do with, with Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity. But at any rate, she sat on the front row. And she missed it. And she was only 12, but she looked like she was 17. So you had all these 12-year-olds, and then you had her. <laughs> and, then they were, and behind her were the next grades. And, you know, she's seventh grade, so they're up front. And uh, she didn't know that you're not supposed to raise your hand during church, so she raised her hand. So I called on her. She'd ask her a question, and uh, I would answer, and everybody else would giggle quietly. And she never noticed it, thankfully. And uh, uh, there's no one and so uh, this is how it went for three days. I'm preaching away. She'd raise her hand. She'd ask a question. I would answer. She had all sorts of questions because she was a seeker. Mm, right. On the third day, she raised her hand at the invitation for salvation. So I sat down with her. And a couple, uh, uh, not far from me, her teacher was praying. The school principal was praying. And I walked through the gospel as thoroughly as I knew how because she didn't know anything about Jesus. Mm. She was right with me. You know how it is when they're right with you. They're going to have to get to, to the one-on-one -on -one invitation because this girl's getting saved. And when we got to that invitation part, her face contorted. It literally yeah. became weird. Uh -oh. And her mind got blitzed. And she could hardly speak. And it finally hit me. I thought, this is not a problem with understanding. She's been understanding all along. This is an overt attack by the enemy. Yeah. And I said to her, do you mind if I pray? And then these glazed eyes, she goes, okay. My friends, I'm nothing, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus is everything. That's right. And we're in him. Yeah. And he's on the throne, far above the enemy. And the best I understood, I took, I claimed uh, uh, our, my position in him and exercised his authority. Take act against the powers of darkness that were seeking to hinder this girl. Do you know, when I said amen, and look back up, her face was back to normal. Mm -hmm. I reviewed the gospel and said, since Jesus is willing to save you, are you willing to depend on him to save you right now? She said, yes. <laughs> and she got saved. Amen. Friends, we can go on the offense. And so that strongholds need to be pulled down. There's faith accessing Christ's authority over the enemy. He's the head. It's his authority. It's not ours. We're the body. We have to exercise it. Just as a body cannot function without a head, a head cannot function without a body. <laughs> and friends, we cannot function without Jesus. We try, yeah. If you try to go against the devil on your own, you're going to get pummeled. That's right. Yeah. But we're not on our own. Right. 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 And God could have set this up however he wanted to, but in Ephesians 1, right with all this authority truth, he gives the imagery where he's the head and we're the body. So we as the body cannot function without him as the head. He as the head has chosen in these kinds of areas not to function without us as the body. That's what we need to know. See, the anointing, so that we can grab a hold of this truth and apply it and exercise his authority when needed over the enemy. You don't have to go around and look for the enemy. He'll come your way. <laughs> yeah. But you just need to know what to do. Yeah. But then there's the other provision. He's in us. Divine ability to deal with the world and the flesh. Now, I love this. Our text says in verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The mood of the verb here is a done deal. This happened when you got saved. Right. You put on Christ. Yeah. But it is significant to note, is it not, over in Romans 13, 14, it switches to the imperative mode. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, wait a second. Why is Galatians saying, you have put on Christ, and Romans saying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is Romans commanding us to do what Galatians says is done? Friends, this is the key. As a matter of fact, you put on Christ when you got saved. As a matter of function, you got to access the provision by faith. And thus, in that sense, put on Christ. Ah. Oh. Now, friends, this is not a second blessing. It is a repeated access of your first blessing. Right, right. But when you've been saved and you haven't accessed your provision for quite a long time, and you finally do, it's like a second blessing. <laughs> and then a third and a fourth and a fifth. I get that. 
But reality, it's not. It's called re Bible. <laughs> life! That's right. Again. That's right. Accessing the life that you receive, the eternal life. Now access that's the abundant life. Wow. Now, when I was getting ordained, the ordination council was going smoothly until somebody asked the question. What is your understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I gave a D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, John R. Rice, I was named after John R. Rice, my mother was his secretary in the 40s, answer, which is, well, you, you've got to, you, I probably used the word seek, the power of the Holy Spirit for service. Well, there was no small stir among the brethren. <laughs> And finally one says, what we're trying to tell you is there's not a man in this room who agrees with what you just said. And uh, so my dad said, don't worry, I'll give him a couple books. <laughs> and uh, we got past that moment. Now, all these years later, that was partially true. Right. See, the modern textbooks say, hey, it all happened when you got saved. Don't worry about it. You don't have to seek anything. Well, it is true it all happened when you got saved. But you need to access That's it. Right. 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 Yes, the other theology is yeah. saying, you've got to see it as if you don't have it. But it's actually both. Yeah. You were baptized into Christ. You were baptized with the Spirit the moment you put your faith in Jesus. But now you've got to by faith access what you have and thus put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can take and act on that anointing. And we can take and act on that filling. And we can ask and we can take on that empowering for service. And there's more detail in all of that. But all of that is available by faith. D.L. Moody was very dedicated and uh, unusual dedication. It was already becoming known because of that. But two older ladies kept telling him, we're praying for you. Well, after a number of weeks of them saying, we're praying for you, he, he got irritated with these ladies. <laughs> so why are you praying for me? Why don't you pray for the sinners who need to be saved? They said, we're praying for you that you might be filled with the Spirit. Amen. They began to recognize, oh, they recognize that there's something, someone, who's missing. Yeah. He yeah. began to seek. And God met with him. If you read his story, it's in New York City. He had a duck into an alley. The presence of God was all over him. And he had to ask God to stay his hand. There's a few testimonies like that. His is one of them. For most, that's not what happens. For most, it's like what happened with Walter Wilson. When he was confronted by a guy that uh, uh, made it clear to him that he was not accessing the Holy Spirit. That he was trying to do the work of the ministry in the strength of the flesh. And that he needed to present himself to God, the Spirit, to be used by God, the Spirit. And so there's more to his story. But at any rate, he goes home after hearing James M. Gray preach on Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's saying you need to present your body to the Spirit uh, and take the Spirit as your personal God, your leader and power source. Now he already knew that he was in dwelt. That's not what we're saying. But taking the provision of who is in you. And he went home and he presented his body. Uh, he said something like this, when I give you my eyes to see through, ears to hear through, tongue to speak through, hands to work through, feet to go through. He presented his body to the Spirit of God and he took the Spirit of God. He told his wife the next day, this is going to be a wonderful day. I took the Spirit as my own personal God. Now see, what he's talking about is the taking what's already been given. The Spirit was given to him the day he got saved. Yeah. But for 17 years he was not accessing that Spirit very often. Right. And when there was understanding, he took guess what happened? He started seeing people saved. Now here's what's interesting. When he took the Spirit that night in his room, he gives no description of, you know, the waves rolling over to him, you know, and staying, asking God to stay his hand and so on. That's what happened to D.L. Moody. That's what happened to Charlie Kittle. That's what happened to others. But for most, it's not what happens. God knows what a person needs. You know what was the same in both stories? The results radically changed. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Right. We're not looking for some dramatic experience. We're looking for the reality of what God says is so. Yes. Taking it by faith. If he wants to give us a moment of sensation, fine. If he doesn't, fine. What needs to happen, though, is when you take, and this is what will happen, he will empower you. He will use you. And so, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting with Duncan Campbell. He had gotten saved, and then this happened on the horse. <laughs> But, there's more to his story. After his wounds healed, 
he went to a what's called the Faith Mission of Edinburgh, Scotland, and was trained for less than a year, but trained in an understanding of life in the Spirit. He went out, uh, they were sent out by twos, and he was wonderfully used of God in a great revival in McDonagall, Scotland. He said hundreds were swept into the kingdom, and he became famous as a young man for the Big Dark Old Revival, that God used him in the Big Dark Old Revival. But then he says an evil hour struck him. He said, I consciously stepped out of the will of God. And his wife were beginning to have kids, and he thought, how is this going to work for me being an evangelist? And so, though he was a God-called evangelist, he, uh, he stepped out. In his case, he says, I consciously stepped out of the will of God. And so for 17 years, he pastored a couple of congregations. He said, oh, you know, he was invited to preach at big conventions and conferences. This is the candle of the big parable revival. He said, but by the end of those 17 years, prayer had become a burden. And the word of God had become a dead word. Mm, oh, boy. And then, one day, his daughter of 16 years of age, which means she was not alive during the, the big dark old revival. She only heard about it. 16-year-old Lassie, as they say over there, she said, Daddy, I want to see you in your study. <laughs> I've been praying for you, and Daddy, I would like to speak to you. So they go into the study. He sits down, and she crawls up in his lap, as daughters sometimes do, and she said, Daddy, when you were a pilgrim in the faith mission, after the First World War, you saw revival in Scotland. You saw revival. She said, Daddy, why is it that God is not using you now in revival? Hmm. Daddy, when's the last time you led a soul to Christ? And Duncan Campbell, the famous convention speaker, was smashed by some questions from his 16-year-old daughter. He couldn't get away from it. He went to a conference. He heard a guy depart from his sermon and gave his own testimony how he had gotten so dry and how God had met with him and he had experience with the Holy Spirit. Duncan Campbell came home and he determined that either he was going to meet with God or he was going to resign the ministry. And he told his wife and his daughter, I'm going into my study to meet with God. So please don't let anyone hinder or, or bother. He said he got down on that rug and he began to seek God. And he said, I cannot tell you all that God said to me in those moments, in that hour. He said, but God met with me. He said, God gave me the word of forgiveness. God gave me the word of recommission. And then he said, I prayed, oh God, won't you give me again what you gave me on the back of that horse? And he said, God did he said a couple hours later he was just reveling in God and his daughter came in and thought he was losing his marbles. <laughs> he said, no, I've never been more seen. He entered back into evangelism and in just a couple of months he was on the island of Lewis for what he thought was going to be a 10-day meeting and <laughs> God came down. Yeah. And he preached on that island for the next three years. Hmm. Wow. Village to village. Now, friends... All of us don't have the same calling as Duncan Campbell, but you've got a calling. And none of us can do it apart from the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, We're in Him. He's in us. Divine authority, divine ability. But it must be accessed by faith. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you for your kind attention tonight as we've walked through really a massive subject and I appreciate your, your listening together. Friends, this is real. This is the provision. This is not just for, a, you know, a select few. This is for every child of God. And friends, it's obviously true that no minister of the gospel can fully be effective apart from the mighty baptism experientially of the Holy Spirit. The truth is, no Christian can be effective in the way that God intends without accessing the same baptism of the Holy Spirit yes. experientially. And you can, if you want to use other words, call the fullness of the Spirit, whatever, that's fine. But the bottom line is we've got to access the provision 
We're in Christ, and He is in us. Yeah. And so in a moment, Marianne's going to play through a verse of the song. And if you need to talk to God about this, if you've been frustrated and the prayer has become uh, cold and, and the Word of God has become dead, mm -hmm. well then, let's go to God about this. Yeah. He knows how to yeah. fix it. And friend, maybe you're here tonight, you're not even saved. See, everything that I just talked about tonight doesn't happen until you get saved. Mm -hmm. Salvation is just not going to heaven. It's getting Jesus into you. If you're not saved yet, you come and tell pastor, I need to get saved. But whatever you need is when you talk to the Spirit of God even now, it's the music price. truth. And we're about to witness uh, we're about to witness the water baptism. Yes. And I trust that as, as we as we celebrate uh, this young man coming to Christ and I hope that you'll pray for him. Yes. Pray for all of our young men. Pray for our young women. I sense a hunger in this room. Yeah. 
you say, well, Pastor, this was really, some of this stuff I've never heard before, it's hard to understand. And I can tell you this, let God teach you. Yeah. Spend time with Him. Don't toil. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Amen. Amen. Ask God to enlighten your mind every time you read the scriptures. Some powerful stuff. Well, we're going to, we're going to witness the yes. beginning stages of this. The picture. Repent, be baptized, that you might take. I love that song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." It says, just from Jesus simply taking life and joy and health and peace. Amen. All right, well, Mom and Dad, maybe Dad can come up and help me here. Amen. Amen. Don't get in until I get this thing out, buddy. <laughs> Even though it wouldn't hurt you. Still not safe. All right. You know, I don't really want to say a whole lot because I want what, I want what Dr. John had to say. I want it to just still be fresh in your minds as you watch this. This is, this is a great opportunity for all of us. I can't say that of all the baptisms I've ever done, I can't say that I've ever baptized someone after a message like that before. And uh, I want you to just think about that. You know, it's, it does represent a death, old life, a burial, and resurrection. Come on in, brother. <laughs> You know you're my brother. Yeah, you're my brother. That's amazing, isn't it? I need to be careful. Oh, <laughs> sit down. Sit down straight. Yeah, there we go. Okay. I dedicated this young man. He was just a little baby. He doesn't even remember that. And I want you to know I love you. And I know that God's got some great plans for you. Yes. Amen. And I also want to encourage you, buddy. Let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believers. Amen. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Be an example. Don't let anybody, you know, you find out the truth. You learn the truth. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, okay? You're going to do that? <clears throat> Let's pray, okay? Now I want you to hold on to this. Let me hold you on to this. Hold on to this, okay? Hold on to this. All right. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, for the truths that we've learned tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that Connor accepted Jesus Christ. On Thanksgiving Day, what a blessing. Yes. And Lord, we pray that as we witness this baptism, this water baptism, Lord, we know that the water does nothing. But it's a symbol of what the Holy Spirit hid yes. with Connor, yes. bringing him through Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd fill him. I pray that he'd access the power of the Holy Spirit yes. in his life. And I pray, Lord, that the world would see Jesus through Connor. Yes. Lord, I thank, you for his, uh, I thank you for his siblings. I thank you for Rachel trusting in Christ. I thank you that, Con I thank you that Evan is asking questions. And Lord, I pray that you would just use all of them, Lord, in a mighty way. Thank you for all of our young people. Lord, we just thank you for Connor again, Lord. Thank you for his parents. Lord, we pray that you would just use him in a mighty way mm -hmm. as we witness what you want to do in Connor. Lord, I pray that he would recognize his position in Christ and that he'd recognize Christ in him. Yes. And I pray, Lord, that you would do mighty things through this young man. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Connor. On the profession of your faith in Christ Jesus, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Raised to the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. All right. Aaron, you want to pull up the uh, the song as he dries off and everything. I want us to sing a song. You know. There's a verse he, he was talking about that we've put on Christ, and that there's another passage where it tells us to, to put on Christ. 
But then we also have another verse that says, be filled with the Spirit. And then in Colossians, I think, it says, you are complete in Him. That's the very same word. So which one is it? <laughs> it's by faith. I want us to sing that. All right? Let's sing that. I want you to just be in prayer for Connor. And pray that we'll see souls saved because of what Christ can do through you. Amen. Through me. Yes. It's available to us tonight. That's encouraging. Praise God. Let's sing it, all right? Complete in thee. Complete in thee the work of mine.